Yes, yes. Omega Watts in the house. Now, now, now let me set the table. Now, now, now let me set the table. Invited to the banquet. I'm glad that you could make it. Invited to the banquet. I'm glad that you could make it. And I'm, I'm part of the leadership team here at the table. And man, we're just so excited that you're here. Um, we've been in the series called Vices. Um, and, and part of the series of Vices, we said there are these things that we feel just have such a grip um, on our lives, right? And they, they literally grip us like, like a vice grip, right? And we talked about um, the last few weeks, there's this idea of there's this ideal version of how we want to live. And there was a reality of where we actually live, um, right? There's this ideal, perfect version where we're perfect and we, there's no brokenness and we're whole and we're complete and there's nothing wrong with us ever, right? And there's a reality, which is not that, right? And how we process this ideal versus real is, is everything whenever it comes to our lives. Um, last week, we talked about gossip. Um, and, and this week, and perhaps the reason you're here, um, we're talking about lust. Um, now, um, as we're setting this up and kind of processing this, um, some years ago, um, I, was working, um, I was working at an organization, and we, were, we went to a, a church leaders conference um, back where, where I was. Um, and at this church leaders conference, um, there was this guy, um, the, the main pastor guy that was like leading this entire conference, um, something that they had said over and over and over and over um, in this conference was just their, their core values and how they were pretty explicit with their core values and the culture that they were trying to set. Um, and one of the things was transparency and vulnerability, right? So, but they didn't just say it. There was one moment during the conference, he's like, look, I know that like, you may consider our church to be large, and it is, and to have some influence, and, and we do have some influence, but look, I, he, was, he was saying this, this leader guy, he was like, oh, look, I'm sinful and broken just like you. Like, I know you may, I don't know how you view me, but I am sinful and broken just like you. Actually, I have a lot of just sexual brokenness in my life. And then he said, you know what? If it was up to me and my flesh, I would sleep with all of your wives. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. As you can imagine, you know, the room is full. There's thousands of people in the room. As you can imagine, the audience was like, can you say that? Like, can you just, can you just say that? Right? And his point was this. He's like, look, that's my, that's my flesh, right? I don't, I don't act out on my flesh, but that's my flesh. That's the thing that I'm waging war against every single day. And I love, so this was years ago, I literally don't remember anything else from that conference. I don't. <laughs> but I remember that line, right? Because I thought um, just the way that he, the, the way that he just modeled, hey, look, this, this shame, it doesn't hold me. This is who I am. This is my brokenness. And look, I don't know, he's saying this, like, I don't know you. You're a bunch of strangers. It's getting recorded, going up on YouTube. But look, this is my brokenness, and my brokenness is not going to bring me shame. As we're talking about lust, I think a lot of us we feel the most shame in our lives because of this, right? We can, talk about, we can talk about gossip last week. We have a great time. There's a lot of laughs. Um, I don't suspect there could, there's going to be a lot of laughter. To, maybe there will be. I don't know. We'll see. Um, okay, well, clearly already proving me wrong. <laughs> I just know, here's my point. I just, I just know that as we're talking about lust, um, it's just something that we just feel so much guilt and shame because of this. And this other, among the other topics, even though nothing is, like, there, there's no, like, um, it, it, lust is equal, kind of among sins, kind of, um, and I'm getting like real theological. Okay, um, my, my point is, um, uh, as we're processing this, I just know that some of us are just carrying a lot of guilt and shame in the room, right? And the reason I know this is because out of all the vices, this was my vice, where I would sit in the audience, where somebody would come up, talk about sexual sin, talk about lust, and I would feel so much guilt and shame sitting there, right? And then I would leave, and I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, let's go, let's do this, I feel, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm just not, never gonna do it ever again, right? And then I would act out again. Here's the cycle of guilt and shame. So here's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pray for us to set us up, but I just know I'm mindful that um, we're a lot, that's not everybody in the room, I just know that we're all starting from different spots, but let me pray for us, and then we'll keep going here. Um, Father, and God, um, we love you, and we thank you, God, and we know that there is no shame and there's no condemnation, God, for those that are in Christ. And I'm praying for all of my, my family and my friends here, God, um, that you can just be helpful to me and that I can be as helpful as possible um, to all of us as we're processing and navigating through lust. So we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, so f- knowing that there is, um, my, the, hear me say as I start off, um, there is healing for me. And I know that because there is healing for me, even in the, the, the midst of my depravity and the things that I experience, like I know for a fact that there can be healing for you. 
right, if, if you want that healing and if you're mo- willing to move forward in, in, the steps for, in the steps, right? And also, I just, my aim today as well is just to give us hope, right? For, for some of us, we just feel completely hopeless, and my aim, is, my hope is that we just feel hope um, because of Jesus. So I know that we're all starting from different spots, though. We're all in different places. For some of us, um, uh, we don't consider lust a vice, right? We, we don't. Whenever I say lust and sexual sin, you just fundamentally disagree with that premise. You're like, I don't, I don't really know what you're talking about, bro. Like, it's my first time here. Like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. And look, and my, my aim actually, my aim is not even to try to convince you that lust is a vice. I'm going to do that in 10 weeks, but not today. Uh, in 10 weeks, we're going to talk about other stuff, um, and talk sex and other, that good stuff. But today, my, my aim today um, is not actually to try to convince you that lust is a vice. Um, for some of us, you would sitting there, you would say, hey, um, lust is not my vice. Um, I would agree that I have vices, but lust is not my vice. And if that's you, you're in the minority. Sheesh. Uh, I, I was researching some, some percentages today, and yeah, um, um, yeah. Uh, men and women uh, across the room, across the board, um, men and women um, just struggle. A lot of us, many of us, historically, currently have struggled, um, struggled with lust. So, but for some of us, um, lust is not my vice. So um, if that's you, then um, my hope is that you can kind of track along and follow along. And my suspicion is for 1,000% you have a friend <laughs> that lust is their struggle. And that hopefully whatever I have to share today can be, also be helpful for you um, as you pass that along to your friends that do want help and healing um, with, with, with lust. Or option C, um, you know, some of us are sitting here and we would say, hey, lust is just a part of who I am. Like, this is just what I do. Like, this has been going on, Isaac, for a long time. Right, this has been going on for a very long time. At this point, this is just who I am, right? And some of us have just given up, given up hope in that, and we just don't care. We feel numb. We've been doing it for a long time. Like, hey, look, this is what I do by myself. This is my choice. I'm not hurting anybody, right? So some of us would say option C is that lust is just part of me. Um, Or, as I mentioned earlier, maybe perhaps you're sitting here in your option D um, to where you're saying, hey, look, yeah, Isaac, whenever you talked about you and your experience where you feel guilt and shame, like that's me sitting here right now, is that even as we're talking about this issue, um, I just feel guilt and I feel shame, right? And to quote the song, The Father's House, uh, check your shame at the door because it ain't welcome anymore. So my hope is that by the time we get to the end, there can be a lot of healing if you're in option D. Um, And, um, uh, or option E, uh, perhaps for some of us, um, we've already found healing with lust, and that's amazing. That's incredible. So that's where we're all starting in different places, but I want to jump in, if you have your Bibles, um, to, to Ephesians chapter 4. And as I've mentioned before, man, I just want to be as honest and grace-filled and truthful and compassionate as possible. I'm not reading the text. This is just Isaac talking, not Scripture. Um, I just want to be as honest and grace-filled and compassionate. Because for those of us that already feel guilt and shame, I don't want to add more guilt and shame. That is not what I'm trying to, trying to do up here. Um, I want to provide compassion and healing and hope. Um, however, there are a few of us that really don't consider, um, don't consider lust to be a vice, don't really consider lust to be that big of an issue. So we will spend some moments where me, with all the caution and the warning of the world, saying, hey, this is something you need to consider in your life, if this is part of your life. Um, so the Apostle Paul, he had, a lot of things, uh, he had a lot of things to say about what is lust and why we lust and what we can do about it. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 where he says this, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. Right? So whenever Paul refers to Gentiles, essentially he's saying, hey, these are just people that do not know God. Right? So people that do not know God, um, they are darkened in their understanding, meaning, um, hey, they're, just, they're unaware. They don't, they don't know how the world works. They don't know how God has designed the world. So there are people that don't know God, and because they don't know God, they don't know God as the designer and the creator of the universe. So they're just unaware of how the world works. Right? And because of this, they're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart, right? So he says that they're alienated from the life of God. Basically, he's saying that, hey, look, God is the source of life. And there are people that are cut off from this life source, right? And these people that are come off from this life source, it's because of their ignorance and the hardness of heart. Um, Around here, we would say it's because of their unteachability, Right? They're just unaware, and they don't want to be teachable and receive uh, help become more aware of how, how the world works. Um, so verse 19, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind 
of impurity, right? So this word callous really just means you can't feel. So here's what's going on. You have this God of the universe who creates this life and is a source of life, and there are people that are, I'm 30 and I burp, I'm sorry, (laughs) y'all. I'm in my 30s, I'm 31, okay. Uh, So there are these people that are cut off from God who's the life source. And as they're cut off from God, the life source, um, they are not getting the life source. And the, the, the natural progression when you're cut off from the life source is that their hearts are hardened. They become really callous. And even it says um, they become callous. They're, they're past the point of being able to feel anything. This is what Paul is saying. It's like they're cut off from the life source. Their hearts are callous and hard. And they're past the point of being able to feel anything, right? So whenever you can't feel anything, we don't like that. So we want to try to feel something, or we want to try to numb a feeling that we don't like, All right? So whenever it comes to sensuality, this is, um, another way to describe this is uncontrolled lust. Uncontrolled lust um, happens whenever we're trying to feel something, right? I was talking to a, a friend recently, and they said, hey, look, you know the feeling that you want to feel, um, you just don't know how to get it. You know the feeling that you're after. You know the feeling you want to feel. You just don't know how to get it, right? And for those of us, that's where our journey with lust starts, is that we're trying to feel something, so we just journey into lust to feel something, right? And then it gets gets darker, and it gets darker, and it gets deeper, and it gets deeper, right? Um, So for um, the definition of lust, just to be really explicit, um, is this sexual desire for what is forbidden, Right? This, um, when it comes to lust, here's how the, the here's how a helpful way to think about it is sexual desire um, for what is forbidden. Right? And this can be this can be with another person, um, either for free or paid. With another person, we act out in lust that way. I don't want. I'm trying not to get too explicit. Um, if you got that, you got that. If you didn't, you're fine. So with another person, free or paid, um, or I'm talking about prostitutes. Y'all know what I'm talking about prostitutes. Okay. Um, or, or it's by ourselves uh, with porn and masturbation, right? So as we think through sexual desire for what is forbidden, right, from, from the Christian worldview, right, from the Christian worldview, this is what it's describing, um, is um, that lust is with another person for free or for paid or by ourselves with porn and masturbation, right? And um, the Apostle Paul actually ra- talks about this also in 1 Thessalonians 4. We're not going to turn there, but I'll just kind of unpack what he's saying there. Is he, he describes it as sexual immorality. In the Greek word, this is the word porneia, right? The word porneia is basically an all-encompassing term that the New Testament frequently uses to describe all sexual immorality all sexual immorality. I'm not going to read an exhaustive list, but I'll point out a few things of what Paul means by sexual immorality, this word porneia. Well, it's where our word pornography comes from, right? This word porneia, so pornography and masturbation. Paul would say that sexual immorality. Um, he would say sex before God's design for marriage is fornication. He would call, he describe that as sexual immorality. Um, sex outside of God's design for marriage, he would call that adultery, which is still porneia, um, sexual immorality. And man, we know the feeling that we want to feel, so we just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Because when we start venturing into sexual immorality, I don't know if you've been there, right? It's really exciting. It's really exciting, right? And we get these feelings, this, this enticement, right, where we feel aroused, we feel excited. Man, it's a rush. Like our heart will even like skip a beat. Like it's really, really excited it's, and it's fleeting, but it's exciting for a moment. And that's what we keep chasing. But as we know, the thing that used to excite us at first, we keep doing it and doing it, and doing it, and doing it, it doesn't keep exciting us. So we're going to go on to something else. We keep doing it, and doing it, we just keep venturing deeper, and deeper, and deeper, and it gets really, really dark um, for some of us, right? Um, And like some of the some of the things that we've seen, some of the things that we've participated in, it's just really dark. And the re- and we even think about it, as we think about a younger version of ourselves, right? We look at ourselves now, or we've looked about ourselves in the past, or some of the things that we've experienced in the past, and we we think, I never thought I would end up there. I never did. If I would imagine myself when I was younger, I never thought that I would have experienced the things that I experienced. I would have participated in the things that I participated in, right? I never thought that I would get there, but here's how we got there. We were cut off from the life source. Our hearts got hard and callous, and now we're chasing feeling. 
and we chase feeling, and we chase feeling, and whenever that feeling doesn't come the way that it used to, we're going to keep chasing feeling until we get that feeling. We know the feeling that we want to feel, and we don't know how to get it, so we're just going to keep searching and searching. Um, and for some of us, our, our line is so far, so far from where we ever thought it would be um, that, that we consider the words of Jesus about lust, and we think that it's like minor leagues, right? We think it's junior JV. Here's what Jesus says about lust. Um, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart, right? So for some of us, we, we see this, we read this, and we're like, a look? Jesus, you're saying you look at somebody and that's lust? Jesus, do you know what I've done? A look would be amazing for me. If I only did a look, that's a win. <laughs> our, our, line, our lines are just so, so far, right, that we, that we read this and we're like, that's impossible. Like, that's the standard that Jesus sets for lust? What, like, that's, that, that's, that's, that's not possible for me. That's, that's not even, uh, cool, like, cool words, Jesus, I love you, but man, like, that's not, that's not reality for me. Um, and here's what's happened, right? So some, of, some of us are just so far in what we would call the lust cycle. So here's the lust cycle. Um, as we mentioned, um, the lust cycle starts, as Paul says, whenever we're cut off from God, right? So that's kind of where it starts, right? We're cut off from God, and we're not connected to the life source that is God. And as we're cut off from God, here's what happens. We can't feel anything, right? Because God is where we get the feelings that we truly want, right? The peace that we want, the joy that we want, the hope that we want, the affections that we want, the things that will truly satisfy us are the things that we can't feel because we're cut off from God. So because we're cut off from God, now we're trying to chase feelings and we can't face the good, true feelings, the, the truest happiness that we actually desire, right? The true um, belonging that we want, the true peace that we want, we can't feel it. So this is where we start acting out in lust, because we're chasing a feeling, as we mentioned. All right, so we're chasing this feeling of lust to cover something up or to cover up bad feelings. And ultimately, here, here's why this is so bad. Here's why lust is so bad. It's because ultimately, whenever we act out in lust, we don't actually get to the feeling that we actually want. Deepest down in our core, as human beings made in the image of God, we don't actually get to the feeling that we want. Here's what ends up happening. We, we don't get that feeling, and then what ends up happening is we end up um, dishonoring and disregarding. Right? We dishonor other people and we disregard God. So what do I mean um, by dishonoring? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, every human being is made in the image of God. And every human being has value and dignity and worth. And because every single human being, so every single person in this room right now, you have value and dignity and worth because um, of God putting his image in you, right? So you have value because God, you are a reflection of who God is, right? Now, because of, because of the fall, we're broken and we're sinful, but man, we are created for good. We are corrupted because of sin and we're bad, but we are created for good because we have God's very image in us. So whenever it talks about dishonoring, um, it's basically saying that we're not going to honor people. Instead, we're going to turn people into objects of our sexual fulfillment, when we're lusting after somebody, this is what Jesus is saying, when we're lusting after somebody, we're basically saying, I want your body, but I don't want your soul. I want you to fulfill me sexually, but I don't care about you in a soul-caring way. Right? Right? And with that, um, even, even if somebody is willing to participate with you, does not make it honoring to them. Right? What do I mean by that? I mean, um, dancers, Sex workers, right? The person you met at the bar, the club, the person you swiped on Tinder, people that will willingly participate to fulfill your sexual desire, even if they're like going along for the ride, that does not, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever it may be, um, that does not give, it, give you permission to dishonor them, even if they say it's okay because they are not the standard. God is the standard. And God says, when you dishonor them, we have a problem. They are my child. And actually it says this, that God says, um, it says, this is First Thessalonians 4, where God actually calls himself an avenger, right? You thought Thor was powerful? Sheesh. <laughs> God calls himself an avenger because he's going to avenge, he's going to punish people that consistently and routinely abuse and dishonor his children. 
God has set up and designed the world in a way where he, he, knows how it, he knows how the world works. He designed it, right? John Piper says this, where he says, God created sexuality. He created it good and beautiful. He created it for the good of his creatures. He alone has the wisdom and the right to show us how to use it for his glory and our good. Lust is what that sexual desire becomes when we give it reign and disregard for God. It completes the cycle, right, where we're cut off from God. We can't feel anything. Because we can't feel anything, we act out in lust. We pursue lust. Because we pursue lust, we dishonor and disregard God. And because we dishonor and we disregard God, we're cut off from God. And the cycle continues over and over and over and over again. And actually, the reason, and I said this, the the reason that God hates lust is because it abuses his children, right, and disregards his design for sexuality. And for some of us, um, we have not... um, some of us have been on the receiving end of somebody else's lust. And the most shame and guilt that we feel is not actually because of anything that we chose to do. It was somebody else that chose to lust, and we become victims, we become, just get wrapped up in participating, right, in, in their choices and their sinful actions, um, and we just get so wrapped up in their world, right? So that's why God says, I'm go- this, this will not be. I'm going to avenge, I'm going to punish those who abuse my children. This is not going to happen. If we're honest, though, um, for for a lot of us here in the room, we would say, yeah, but going off of Jesus' standard of lust, I've also lusted. So not only have I been on the receiving end of lust, I've also been on the giving, um, active giving end of lust. So God says, all right, well, I'm going to punish. I'm going to avenge because I'm going to punish people that disregard, um, that dishonor my children and disregard my design for sexuality. This is where the story gets bad, but here's where the story gets really good. It's Jesus. The punishment that we deserve because of our lust, Jesus took it. We were created for good. We are broken because of evil. God knew this. God, God set up a plan in motion where Jesus on the cross would take all the punishment that we deserve from lust. So if you've lusted, that's why we say there is no shame. In Romans 8.1, he says there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ because of this. Because God is going to punish those that abuse his children. And for those of us that have lusted, we've abused God's children as we're lusting after people, right? And that's why Jesus died on the cross, to take the punishment that we deserve. So God... Um, Um, Jesus appeases the wrath of God because of our lustful intent and takes that. So I don't know why there would be any other response than just say, Jesus, thank you. I don't deserve it. Man, Jesus, you see like how awful I am, the things that I've done, the things that I've participated in, how bad it got. And it says that Jesus sees us in our worst moments and he died for us. He sees us in the midst of our sin and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And because Jesus died and rose again, and with, with resurrection power, right, there is no shame. I don't care what you did an hour ago. I don't care what you've done this week. I don't care what you've participated in. I don't care what plans you had after the table. I hope you don't do them. I don't know what plans you already had. Here's my point. Um, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, and you believe in Jesus, there is no shame for any sort of lust you're bringing here in this room tonight. And my prayer and my hope is that because of Jesus, you feel free. This is grace. Nothing that you've deserved, nothing that you've earned, this is grace. Freely given from God because of all, for all the, the lust that we've done. Right? This is grace. Um, so as we continue... As we continue in these cycles, right, where we're, where we're cut off from God, we can't feel anything, we lust, we dishonor God, you notice the arrows got a lot bigger, right? <laughs> so, because we, li- we live in this tension. We live in this tension where the, the last few minutes, most of us, we know that's true. We've believed that for a long time, we've professed that for a long time, we've been baptized for a long time, and we still feel stuck in this lust cycle. And my suspicion, that's where some of us in this room feel. We just feel stuck in the lust cycle. We know we put our faith and trust in Christ. We know Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We know that we have a new life in Jesus, um, and yet we still feel stuck. Well, here's why we feel stuck. It's because the first diagram, can we go back to the first slide, the one before? Um, the first one, you can see the arrows are pretty small. As you start doing it, 
arrows get a lot bigger because it creates a pathway, right? It's literally our, bri- our, our brains get rewired to not be able to control ourselves, right? Because our, our brain just start craving whatever pornography we've been looking at, whatever person we've been with, whatever sexual thing that we've done, our brain just start craving that, right? And even though we have all the intent in the world to stop, if we're stuck in the lust cycle, for a lot of us, if, if we have patterns of doing it and patterns and patterns and patterns and patterns and patterns, these patterns and these pathways are so, so strong and so reinforced that this is exactly what Paul says as we kicked off the series, right? Where he says, hey, look, I, I'm not doing the things that I want to do, and I am doing the things that I don't want to do. This is why. Because the pathways in our brain get so strong, right? So it's going to require something in order to help break that, right? And this, when, as the patterns get really deep and really strong, right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect our relationships, right? We're now, whatever thing that we're lusting with now becomes the preferred relationship for us. It's not a good, godly, healthy relationship, but this, it's this other lustful, preferred relationship. Um, and we actually will withdraw withdraw from real, actual, healthy um, relationships um, in order to prefer these lustful relationships, right? It's because these patterns are so strong in our brains, right? And as we do that, right, as we notice ourselves preferring this thing that we know is not real, this thing that we know is a fantasy, right, um, this, this guy that we know that has n- are not, ha- does not have our good best interests, that just wants to use us, this girl that just wants to use us, um, whatever site we're on, that uh, we just keep going back to over and over and over and over again, that's when we feel shame and guilt. So because these pathways are so strong. So here's the big idea. Here's your big idea. Is that lust is actually not your biggest problem. It's not. Lust isn't your biggest problem. Being disconnected from God is your biggest problem. You want to help with, you want to break the lust cycle, right? You got to get connected to God. That's the only answer, right? If you keep trying to like, all right, I'm not, for some of us, we've tried this. Where it's, um, if in the like, psychology world, they call it white knuckling. So we're like, all right, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it again. All right. All right, and you went to that camp that one time, you went to that group that one time, and you went to that service that one time, and you, you finished, and you felt so good, and your heart was so full. Like, oh, I feel so amazing right now. I'm never going to sin again. All right, and then you leave, and you're good for, I don't know, an hour for some of us, a day for some of us, a week for some of us, maybe six months for some of us. And then we notice ourselves just back in these patterns, because white knuckling, just saying we're not going to do it only helps so much. It actually doesn't, ultimately, it does not help, right? But we think that, okay, if I can just figure out lust and not lust, this, then I'll be good, right? But being disconnected from God is actually um, your biggest problem, all right? And um, for me, I know this is true because this is my story, right? Um, this was me for, for a lot of my life where I, I thought lust was my biggest problem. And then I was able to find hope and healing. And here's what I realized. Oh, man, I actually have a lot of other stuff I need to process, like, now there's, like, anxiety stuff that comes up. Um, there's approval stuff that comes up. Um, there's insecurity stuff that come up. I thought it was just, I thought it was just lust. <laughs> and God's like, yeah, okay, we're, we're healing you here, but you're still broken. There are these other things that we need to work on, right? And, and for me, just acting out in lust, it was just, um, it was delaying the, the, the healing in other parts of my heart because I thought lust was my problem. But when I realized that lust wasn't my problem, I mean, it was, and we were able to, it was, but it's not the biggest problem. But the biggest problem was actually getting to the root. Lust is the symptom. It's not a disease. When you're acting out in lust, it's a symptom of something that's going on, right? It's not actually at the heart. It's not the disease of what's going on um, in your life, right? So, and being connect, disconnected from God, um, this is, as, um, as Paul says, he calls it being hard-hearted as we're disconnected. This is a heart issue. This is not a head problem, right? So the answer is not um, just to, you know, get connected to God by just learning more knowledge. That's not going to help. Um, or just reading the Bible more or memorizing more verses. That, that may be helpful as part of your, your healing and growth plan. But ultimately, that, that's just thinking that it's a head problem. It's actually a heart problem. So we need to get to the heart, right? And at the heart, um, there's, there, we have a feelings problem. We actually have an, we have an affections problem. We have a desire problem. We have a longing problem. At the core of who we are, do we, long God, do we long for God truly, or do we just want to be connected to God enough so then we can get the stuff that he wants to give us? 
This is, a long, this is at the core of who we are. It's a desire problem. It's a longing problem. It's an affections problem, right? So how do we break out of the lust cycle and connect to God? So we're, gonna, we're, we're back in Ephesians um, chapter 4. We're just going to keep reading in the passage where Paul says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth, as the truth is in Jesus, right? So then he says something really interesting, and this is kind of really get, gets the really helpful application. How do we break the lust cycle? How do we connect back to God? Here's what Paul says. He says, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt with deceitful desires, right? The, we feel this, right? These deceitful desires, this fantasy that we're living in, we know it's fantasy. We know we need to take off our old self. And for some of us, we've tried taking off our old self, and it just keeps wanting to come back, <laughs> Right? And we're like, okay, you stay here. Right? And you walk away, and it's like, and it just like jumps on your back. And you're like, whoa, where'd you come from? We have these, we just have these, these old, these old, our old self that just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and coming up. And we try and we try. And this is whenever, this is what white knuckling is, is just trying to take off the old self. Right? This is saying, hey, look, you're doing over here. I'm just stop. This is like the, um, if, if you grew up in church, not everybody did, but if you grew up in church and you've had a process lust before, right, uh, my suspicion is that to some extent in your life you heard a version of this. Um, stop it. <laughs> and you're like, cool, what else? And you're like, oh, yeah, okay, here's the second part. No, it's, no, for sure, stop it. And you're like, okay, well, that's not, like, that's not helpful, right? I mean, and it's part of the equation. Um, self-control and restraint um, is, is a big part of what's going on, but we have to include the second part of what he says here in verse 23, where he says, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness, right? So he, he's basically saying to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, um, this is spiritual science, that's what I'll call it. Spiritual science. There are actually, as we talked about, there, there are the, the pathways in our brain, literal pathways in our brain, and then as we keep doing the same things over and over and over and over and over again, these pathways just get reinforced. So Paul is being a spiritual scientist. Where he's saying, look, looking at your brain, you have to rework, you have to remap the pathways in your brain. You have to. There's no other option. You have to literally rework the pathways in your brain to think new things. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds as you put on the new self. Your brain literally has to change. So that's why just white-knuckling it, that's why just taking off the old self doesn't work. Because even if you're saying, um, okay, I'm not going to lust, I'm not going to lust, I'm not going to lust, you're still thinking about lust. And your brain is still processing in the same way. And these patterns are still very strong. You have to rework the patterns in your brain. And y'all, that takes work. That takes effort. It takes a lot of effort, which is why, for a lot of us, if you, if you struggle with this for a while, um, you feel defeated because you've been, been trying to stop it. And you can't stop it. And Paul says, you can't stop it. Look, <laughs> this is Paul. I wrote the Bible. You can't stop it. You ha we, there, there's effort and there's work to rework the, these new pathways in your brain as we put on the new self. So as we're... I, I want to give us six really practical steps um, to help us, it, three steps to, to take off the old and three steps to put on the new, All right? So that's what we're gonna, how we're going to spend the rest of our time um, together today. Um, six practical steps. So um, b before we get into it, I think we need to, as we're taking off old and putting on new, um, we just need to try new things, right? For some of us, we keep trying the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, and it doesn't work. And that's why you still feel stuck in the lust cycle. It's because you're not trying new things, right? So I'm, ho I'm hoping that as we present the six practical steps, that something may be fresh, something may be new, and I'm incredibly confident that if you do the effort and work through the process, right, um, then you will find incredible healing in ways that you've never experienced before. So number one is to admit. Is admit, right? Um, this was a big issue for me for a long time. I couldn't admit. I thought, yeah, this is bad. This isn't great. I can, I'll just stop when I want to, right? And then I would, like, try to stop when I wanted to, and I wasn't able to stop. And I was like, yeah, but I didn't actually want to. <laughs> I couldn't admit that I had a problem. The first step is to admit, right? For those of us that feel that this is such a part of our story, that we feel like um, this is just who we are, it's not who you are. You are made in the image of Christ. It's not who you are. 
It's part of your brokenness, but that's what we need to admit, the brokenness. But fundamentally, we need to hold on to the ideal that this is not who you are and there's a better pathway forward, that you don't have to live in shame, live in guilt. You don't have to do the things that you've been doing over and over and over again. So for some of us, this is incredibly difficult. It's going to be incredibly difficult. My suspicion is that if you could admit to yourself there's a lust problem, it's the first step to find incredibly fruitful healing in your life. Number two, just confess. We talked about this in the last few weeks. Um, con- confession merely means to agree, right? Um, James 5.16 says that we want to confess our sins to one another um, and pray for one another so that we might, may find healing, right? So we, as we confess, we just want to agree with God as we admit, but we also want to confess to somebody else, right? I, and that's why I loved what the guy did um, at the conference because he basically confessed his brokenness to the entire audience, <laughs> And we were like, cool, <laughs> like, that's, like, that's amazing, you want to sleep with everybody's wife, which, which is not. But, like, his, his ability to just, like, hey, look, this doesn't own me. Like, this is part of my brokenness, I confess this. He went up, later went on to share that he was part of, a, part of a group where he just regularly confessed the sin in his life with them. Um, we need to confess, we need to get out, and, out into the open. And as we confess, for some of us, this is absolutely terrifying. This terrifies us. You're like, I could never do that. Um, think of it like a muscle. Um, the more that you start confessing, so just start with, start, you can start small, you can start with one really trusted person, and that may all, may all you need um, to take steps forward. But you start with one person, you start really small. And as you start small, you take a small step, you're like, oh, oh I can do this. Oh, okay, wow, I was met with a lot of grace and acceptance, and I thought they were going to like heap shame and guilt and told me I was going to hell. But they actually like told, told me they loved me, and that Jesus loved me, and they were glad that I shared. Right? So for some of us, we just need to confess and start just letting our safe people in um, to our circles um, to let them know what's going on um, as we confess. Number three is pray. Pray. Um, Historically, I'm actually not the best at prayer. I just kind of (laughs) forget. I think that it's like my own ability that can actually accomplish things. So um, for me, I could do like, okay, if I was listening to myself speak right now, which would be weird, I'd be like, okay, admit, yep, confess, yep, pray, eh, what's for (laughs) Prayer is so important, so important, as we're just utterly dependent on God, asking for his guidance, asking for the Holy Spirit to come in. If you're really truly in a season where you're battling lust, you need to put like on your mirror or something in the morning or setting a reminder to pray active every day because any sort of steps that you try to take outside of asking God for help is going to be meaningless and fruitless. You are completely, utterly um, incapable of doing anything without, without God um, providing help. And we need to pray and ask, inviting God into our process for healing. So prayer is incredibly important. All right, so those are the things that we can do to help take some things off. Now I want to move into three things, four, five, and six, um, that it will help us put some things on and put some new things on. So uh, number four is I want you to plan in advance the three C's. Right? And, but the three C's is comfort, connection, and control. What do I mean by that? Um, comfort, connection, and control are really, um, really good feelings that God gives us really healthy ways to channel it. But remember the, the lust cycle is that whenever we start with God as a life source, and then whenever we're cut off, we don't feel these feelings. So now we're going to go try to find these feelings in other avenues. So for com- if, if we're lacking comfort, a lot of us will then go to a lustful activity to find comfort, right? So we feel, um, maybe we feel like we've had a really hard day, right? You've had a really hard day at work. You just had a really hard relation. You had a really hard conversation with a friend. Um, perhaps um, you had like a really just bad date experience, whatever, whatever it may be, and you just want to be comforted. So the, pa- the pattern in your brain is you're going to go home and you're going to comfort yourself or go and do something to comfort yourself, right? So comfort. So that's, um, so whenever I say plan in advance, what are other things that bring you comfort, is it a heavy blanket? Is it like a really cool movie with a, with a nice drink? Is it popcorn? Is it, um, is it going out, um, riding on an electric scooter around Baldwin Park? I don't know. What, like, what's your thing? What? That was very specific, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever your thing is, you know. So that's why I'm saying plan in advance because as you're just being hit with like, w- these feelings of like wanting to act out and lust and you're just trying to find comfort, if you don't have a game plan, you're going to act out and lust. You need a game plan ahead of time. 
whenever you're not feeling those feelings of like wanting comfort. So plan in advance. What are things that you can do when you want comfort? What are things you can do, right, to help you go find comfort that's not in a lustful outlet? Right? Connection, it's the same thing. For some of us, the reason we're so um, addicted and stuck in the lust cycle is because we just feel really lonely and we lack connection. So then we go to people and we go to, we go to um, on the internet or whatever it may be to help find connection because we know that certain people will never reject us. So we just, that's our outlet for connection. So what, what's, another, what's another, something healthy that's an outlet for connection? What is it in your world? Is there, an, is there a friend that you really enjoy that you have like a really good relationship with that then you can, you can connect with? Like, hey, would you mind like if I'm ever like feeling like really a lot of strong feelings, um, would it be okay if I called you just to have a quick conversation just so I can, I can feel connection? Um, hey, um, can, he, can I like go out to, and do like a certain, um, you know, I, I notice people hanging out. Like can I go out and hang out with, like with that friend group or whatever? it may be, um, you need to plan an advanced connection um, and what are things you can do for connection. In control, um, for some of us, we, we don't feel in control, so we're going to go act out in a way that we do have control. So n- be mindful of control, right? Some of you, maybe you're really into, um, really into your finances, right? And um, perhaps um, going into your like, budgeting is like a way to, for some, feel really out of control. <laughs> um, but for some, you know, if, let's say you just really enjoy finances. You're like, okay, whenever, um, you know, whenever I'm just feeling feelings, I'm going to actually go into my bank account and I'm going to look at my budgeting app and I'm going to figure out a way just to kind of make another game plan just to help, help me process this. Um, I, lear- I learned this as well, that typically whenever the, the feelings of lust come on really strongly, like let's say you're just at, at your... Um, by yourself at home, and just feelings come on really quickly, um, it typically lasts two to six minutes. Don't count it. It's not going to be helpful. But just be mindful that it'll last two to six minutes, and if you can pr- get your mind on another activity that you've already pre-planned and can get through with God's help, with prayer, those two to six minutes, you'll, hi- you'll find a lot more success in your healing. Okay. Uh, number five. Uh, we have an amazing counseling center. We have an amazing counseling center here. We've talked about it before. Um, we're actually going to have um, a representative from the counseling center here in a few weeks for you to be able to ask questions to. Um, we have an amazing counseling center. And I know for, um, for many, many people, um, counseling is incredibly helpful, right? Just one-on-one being able to process because we've been so cut off from God that we need someone that can help get into the weeds of our life that's an expert at knowing how to navigate the weeds of our life. Right? So, and, and there are people that are, that are trained in being able to help people process trauma, to process past things. There's a reason you're addicted to lust. And the reason you're addicted to lust, not everyone, but for those of us that are, the reason you're addicted to lust is, po- is, is because of some trauma, some childhood experience that you had, something that you've experienced. And you, you, that's why the pathway got created in the first place. So by going to counseling, it's going to help un- dismantle some of those really early pathways. And if you can start dismantling those really early pathways in your brain from when you were a child, from the things that you experienced, um, then you will find so much more, um, so much more healing and, and really um, taking a lot of amazing steps forward. Um, so here's a website right now, um, firstorlandocounseling.com. You can go there on your own time, but firstorlandocounseling.com. Um, and if you have more questions about counseling, we'll have a representative here um, in a few weeks. That's number five. And last one, number six. Um, in all my research, number six was the most important. Uh, other than, well, God and prayer. But, like, as far as, like, putting new things on, put it, putting new things on, like, number six is, like, the thing. Find, get in a support group. Get in a support group. If you actually want to see victory in your life, if you want to find healing in your life, you're not going to find healing if you don't get in a support group. Right? Um, there's something here. Um, it's um, it's all, also on Tuesday nights, but as I mentioned a few weeks ago, there may, be, there may need to be a season where you're not here at the table on a Tuesday. You're at Celebrate Recovery on, on a Tuesday. And that's the steps that you need to take um, as you're processing um, just your life. And um, It's a 12-step program that will really help um, you process um, just your ex- past experiences and trauma and lust. And um, There's also this thing, um, smallgroupsonline.com. All right, um, smallgroupsonline.com. And as you go there, I, I, went, I went there today just to make sure that what I was saying was accurate. Um, on smallgroupsonline.com, you go there, and they actually have these virtual groups that you can join. And it's people just like you that are struggling with lust, just like you. And perhaps you don't feel, um, 
perhaps the, the best next step for you is you want to take steps forward, but you're still working up to that, to talking to people you know about it. So perhaps the best next thing is to talk to a bunch of strangers <laughs> uh, online in a, in a virtual group. So they have both men's and women's groups there, a small groups online.com as well as Celebrate Recovery also has men's and women's groups. Um, uh, thirdly, um, there's this thing called Conquer Series. Now, in, in this Conquer Series is um, in the advertising um, it's primarily geared towards men. However, um, I talked to them yesterday, um, and they, what they said was, um, even, though the, even though historically the content has been geared toward men, they're, they're trying to work in ways to add in a content for women, but even in the content, they still said that women have gone through it and ha- have had incredible success, just know, just replace man with woman, right? <laughs> um, so I, I thought, in asking around here at First Orlando, um, the Conquer series was, um, I was recommended by multiple people um, but this is like the best, most helpful thing. So I looked at, checked out the content um, a few days ago just to make sure, make sure it was good. And um, I think it'll be helpful um, for all of us. Man, I am, as I mentioned this to you, I want to make sure I say this. Um, as you get in a group, it's really, really important to make sure that there's a proven leader who knows what they're talking about, right? In my, in, as, in my struggle with lust before, I've been in groups where there's a bunch of guys that got together, right? And they're like, all right, who struggled with lust this week? And everyone raised their hand. Like, all right, so we're not going to do it again? Nope. All right, see you guys next week. (laughs) And we showed up just week after week after week. And I think there was good intent, right, where I think we wanted to try to get it out there. But part of the reason that it didn't work in that way is because there was not a proven leader that knew what they were talking about. It was just a bunch of dudes with good intent, right? So it's really important, which is why I specifically mentioned these three, um, because it's really important to have a proven leader as you join a group and not just getting a bunch of people together that all struggle because you just won't know what to do to take the most helpful, best next steps. You're trying to put on some new things. Man, I, with, with lust, um, I don't want you to feel bad, which is why I said, hey, look, check your shame at the door. There's no shame here. There's no condemnation, but I also don't want it to ruin your life. There's a pathway forward where it does not have to be part of your life anymore, and that's my hope for you, and that's my prayer for you, is that you can find healing and hope in Jesus and take steps forward in victory, right, as you're processing lust. And I know for some of us, we think, you know, you've listened to me talk for a while, and you're like, yeah, that's, I was like, bro, that's, that's impossible. I don't think it's impossible. I really don't. In your life, I don't think it's impossible, but I think it's going to take effort, right? I think it's going to take effort on your part to truly take steps for the, those of us that want to find healing. That's my prayer, right? So if you want to talk with me, you're welcome to talk with me. If you want to talk to our staff team, you're welcome to talk to our staff team. Um, we can set up set up a coffee, set up a one-on-one. Um, I'll, it, on this specific issue, I'm just saying it from here. I'm probably only going to not probably. I'm only going to meet with guys. <laughs> uh, we have females that we can meet with, and we have uh, Britt and Dana and others on our staff team that can meet with females. Um, but man, we we there is no shame. There is no condemnation, right? And I hope that maybe perhaps for the first time um, you feel hope in something that you felt hopeless in. So we're just going to sing um, as a as a. T- um, as we respond, I'm going to pray for us. God, I love you, and I thank you. God, we're so grateful for you, just for your love for us, God, and we don't have to feel shame anymore. God, I'm just praying for all my friends here at the table. God, that whatever our experience has been with lust, whatever our, our struggle has been with lust, God, that you will um, help guide us and lead us moving forward in healing. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.